Candace Horbach. Welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you for having me. So I was just telling you offline that you have quite an interesting journey. Um, and I'm really impressed, by the way, with your resilience, your grit, your unstoppable nature to create the life that you want to live. And I admire that because most people, here's a quote from Earl Nightingale. He said, most people tiptoe their way through life, hoping to land safely on death's door. And that is not the way we want to live our life. And that is not the way you're living your life. So I admire that about you right off the bat. And I'd love to just rewind and share your backstory and the journey to got to that brought you to where you are today. That is such a powerful quote. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I hope that resonates with a lot of people because I know it, it did with me. Uh, I spent like the last 12 plus years in the adult industry. I got in relatively young, like right around 19. Um Obviously, that is not tiptoeing throughout life. That is just like <laughs> embracing it with open arms and, you know, jumping into the deep end. And for that, that decision of mine, a lot of people ask, like, you know, how did you get into it? Why did you get into it? And I, I've answered this like a thousand different ways because it's still something that I'm trying to, I guess, get to the root of or understand. And I believe that there's this fine dance between free will and destiny. Um, and like fate, if you will. So I think everyone's probably had a moment where you just felt really pulled to something and you couldn't really articulate it and really understand the nature of it. But you just knew that that's where you were supposed to be in that time. And that's the best way I can describe it. I mean, obviously, there's like a constellation of events that had led me there. But I guess the main um, the main takeaway was like it was just like this pull that I couldn't I couldn't ignore. And it was just something I that really fascinated me. And like that, the idea of being able to kind of step into your feminine power and like use that as a superpower, like use that as a way to um, have radical confidence and tap into your sexuality and like this ultimate type of freedom that I didn't see elsewhere. I don't think I would have survived in a regular job. It's just not my nature. So having someone tell me where to be, how to dress, um, how long to work, where to work, like it just, it was, it's too much control and it wouldn't have worked. Um, so I spent a very long time there. I ended up leaving because a series of, I guess, unfortunate events. Um, I was a contract star for most of my career, which is what I wanted. And it seemed like it was going to be like the easiest, most predictable way to have um, predictable income, control who I was shooting with, know exactly what was going to happen on set, just like have a sense of control over it was not the case. And I guess long story short, and it, we can get into it if you want, but um, like my boundaries were just like continuously tested and crossed. And I just said, absolutely not, I'm not doing this anymore. So I ended up starting my own production company. Um, and I did that for a couple of years. And now I actually have an agency where we're actually helping creators own their own content. Um, we kind of like help them realize like their worth and their potential and like encourage them to diversify and to kind of use uh, content creation as a stepping stone rather than a means to an end. So like how can you catapult this into something else? Because hopefully we're always evolving and growing and so are our interests. And um, just like a, you know, a sports athlete, our shelf life is not very long. Or maybe AI will change that. You know, Maybe you'll be able to do some cool stuff with like replicating your brand in the future. But right now like it's not very stable. So it's like how can you secure your future and follow your passion and like uh, I guess, set yourself up for growth. Yeah, that's well said. So you mentioned the word, uh, you said radical confidence, I think you said. W where did that stem from? Did you always have that trait? Is that something that you lacked as a kid and, and you found that so intriguing to develop that? And over time you developed that, like, where did that come from? So I was always an entertainer growing up. I loved the camera. Um, I had this like very intense energy that all changed when my parents divorced. So when my parents divorced, I was really young. We started moving around a lot. There was a ton of instability. Eventually, there was a lot of abuse. And um, all of that kind of made me go inward. And I got picked on a ton. So I look... Uh, a lot different than I did as a little kid. Like I had like very dark hair. Um, I looked a lot more Asian for some reason. I think when you're mixed, like that you start to grow out of it as you get older. But I looked 
like just 100 percent japanese so i went to pre- like mostly white schools and i got picked on a lot for like my eyes and just how i looked or the food i would bring to school so um all of these like little moments kind of like made me go inward and create this really thick armor around myself so as i got older like 18 you know 16 17 18 It was something I wanted to kind of reclaim, like rediscover that confidence. And I felt like it had been taken away from me. And for some reason, I ended up, again, like the constellation of events, I ended up within the adult um, entertainment industry. And like throughout that journey, it's going to sound maybe contrary to like popular belief, but I actually developed my confidence there. I think it's because we're told you have to like look a spe- like a specific way and only blondes with big boobs are attractive. And then once you get into that industry, you realize there's so many different kinds of bodies and so many different kinds of people. And when you look at the most successful stars, there's not like a huge commonality as far as aesthetic goes. Like they, it's across the board. So then you kind of learn to embrace your uniqueness and like maybe the things that you would have seen as flaws um, prior. So it, it just shows you I don't know. It shows you that like sexuality and that confidence is something internal. It's not something that's necessarily just strictly on the outside. Yeah. Just like happiness, right? It's yeah. A, it's an inside job. Um, I know that as a, as a kid, you ha- um, were intrigued with like Carmen Electra, Pamela Anderson, and these, these models. And that kind of inspired you a little bit to be on this journey. But when you talk about developing going in within and developing this internal confidence and deciding to go into the adult entertainment industry what were some of the comments being made to you from maybe family members and friends when you started to, you were 19 years old so i'm sure people were like what are you doing this is crazy whatever negative comments like how did you handle that what were some of the things people were saying that were close to you so i actually had a lot of people that just cut me off and um, some people still never like bridge that gap. Like I still don't talk to certain family members because of that decision. That's not my like that has nothing to do with me. And I know people can maybe like argue that point, but it's not, you know, like that's something I believe that people are mirrors and the way that we show up to one another. If something instills like a really visceral or a really big reaction out of us, it has more to do with like us and our our own journey and like maybe stuff that we haven't. Um, played around with or explored or figured out like why are these my values beliefs and systems and we kind of just took them on as a default mode rather than uh consciously adapting like adopting them ourselves so um i try to take more of like a stoic stance on those relationships and you know when and if they come around then i'll be here approval was not something that ever really hit my radar and it still doesn't i feel like um the most important people in my life love me regardless of my decisions. Like they, I can make a mistake and they're still there. Like it's truly unconditional love and acceptance. And those are the people I want around me. If someone is putting all, on all of these conditions for our relationship, I'm not interested in that. Um, so I don't know. From from a very young age, approval wasn't something I really sh- like sought after. So even though everyone was telling me not to, like I just like again, like it was this knowing. It was a knowing that that was something that I had to go explore, and I knew it was going to be a, a huge part of my development as a person. So it's not somewhere I stayed. Right again, we talked about earlier. Like hopefully you're growing and always expanding. And again, that decision was right in that moment. I'm not going to go back into the industry at this stage in my life. It doesn't make sense for me. And that would be a step backwards from my own development. But um, it was just true and like authentic to who I was at the moment. So anything that anyone else had to say wasn't really relevant to me. That's admirable. And I I hope those listening and watching could use what you just said to whatever situation they're dealing with. Because so many people have passions and desires and goals and dreams, but they let society or family members and friends project what they think they should be doing to uh, to overcome their actual internal state and, and their desires. So I love that you didn't let that happen with you. You, you didn't uh, need approval. And it reminds me of another quote. I'm going to share another quote with you. Um, this is an old quote from Bob Proctor. And I wanna, I'm going to share the quote and I want to hear your thoughts on the quote because it reminds me of what you just said. The quote is this, if I want to be free, I've got to be me, not the me, my parents think I should be, not the me my husband thinks I should be, not the me my children think I should be. If I want to be free, I've got to be me and I better know who me is. I want to take a minute to share something with you as we take a break from the video you're watching. 
you know, one of the most common things I see to why people don't have enough energy levels, they have trouble building lean muscle mass, they have brain fog, fatigue, and they don't feel good is because of a deficiency in a hormone called testosterone. Now, testosterone is a very important hormone to have in a healthy amount for both men and for women. So how do you reclaim your vitality? How do you reclaim this very important fat burning and muscle building hormone? Well, you can do it with a powerful supplement called Upgraded T. It has been my go-to for naturally elevating testosterone levels. Upgraded tea is from Upgraded Formulas, and it contains the highest quality of ingredients that have been proven scientifically to increase testosterone production. Now, as I mentioned, if you're a woman watching this, this is very important for you just as a man watching this right now. Upgraded tea is a natural and safe way to boost testosterone levels. When you boost testosterone levels, it's going to increase your sex drive, vitality. It could help replace fatigue with all-day energy. It'll help you lose that stubborn belly fat. Uh, testosterone is required for fat burning, so it'll help you with the last 5 to 10 pounds that you're looking to lose. It helps you be in a better mood, helps with your memory and focus. So here's the three-step approach. Step one, take two capsules of upgraded tea with water every morning. It does not break your fast. You can have it with food or without food. Step number two, notice your energy levels and dominate your day with more confidence and more vitality. Step number three, Wake up the next day having better sleep and just keep doing what you're doing. As simple as that. So if you want to get your hands on upgraded formulas, upgraded tea, and any of their awesome products like their upgraded magnesium and their hair mineral analysis testing kit, head over to upgradedformulas.com. And if you use the coupon code ketosis at checkout, they're going to give you 15% off your entire order. That is upgradedformulas.com, ketosis at checkout. We're going to drop that link down below. And let's get back to today's video. Wow. That's amazing. And I think you owe it to everyone in your life to discover who you is. Right. And it's some, it's something I think I fall into the trap all the time. I think a lot of moms do too. It's we identify as our roles, right? So who am I? Like write that down. Like who am I as an exercise? This is some, like I have this um, kind of like spiritual teacher and this was one of my homework assignments. And he was like, who are, who do you think you are? And I w wrote down uh, and I knew my answer was going to be wrong, but I just wanted to answer it how I felt in the moment and like what I actually honestly tell myself every day. Not like if I sit there and I try to get super spiritual, like who am I? Like, no, like who do I tell myself every day that Candace is? And I answered a wife, a mom, a podcaster, an explorer, a learner. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll get points for explorer and learner because that's like not so much a role. And he's just laughing and shaking his head. And he's like, those are doings. That's not who you, mm. that's not who you are. Those are all things that you are doing. So you have to get down to the essence of who am I? And that essence is like an energy. It's got a signature. And um, he gave me a couple examples like he brought up Alex Gray and he's like you know he's an artist and that artist evolves and you you as a person are evolving so like who are you um so I'm still answering that and I think a lot of people are and I think just That's a, spend time on it you know that is a very important question to ponder and spend some time on so you know it got me thinking like who am I I I for me you know what resonates with me is that I, I'm a teacher um I love to teach. I love to study and I love to educate and I love to teach the masses. And that, uh, that evolves over time. But when it comes down to the core, I, I feel like that's who I am. I, I am a teacher and I just want to teach people how to live a healthy, abundant life. That's how I feel. That's beautiful. It, it sounds like Thank you've you, been Jamie. working on that question. <laughs> that <you've> been... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, that's a question I've been pondering for quite some time. And that's what I feel resonates with me to the core. Uh, right now at this very moment. So you, during your journey, you, you mentioned there were some unfortunate events where it kind of forced you to make the decision. May, it, it forced you to make that decision to get out of the adult entertainment industry. And I know I've, when I was studying and getting ready for the interview here, I know there's some specific stories with like directors wanting you to do things that were against what you believed in. And you you put your foot down, even though at that moment it was like, a lot of heat, not with just the director and the financial part, but the other people in the filming. How, how do you, how does somebody do that? Like, meaning if somebody's in a situation where they feel like this is not right, but there's so much pressure to do it anyways, how does that person put their foot down and make sure they do what's right to their, what they feel is right to their core? So I'm a big advocate for like 
practicing what you preach and like showing up and um, listening to your own advice because often we it's so easy to dish it out to other people and not live by the words that you you're often caught saying so Mm -hmm. for me I've always had like this really strong ferocious warrior like warrior-esque nature to me I think a lot of it was how I was raised I'm the oldest I've there again like there was abuse in the in growing up so um, I've had to learn how to defend myself and I've had to learn how to be self-sufficient and like stand up for what um, what I believe in so I get a part of it is just my nature and then I also feel like a sense of duty and responsibility it's like who if not me then who right it's that that old quote and if not now then when so if I see something and I'm the observer in that moment, it's my responsibility to do something with it because no one else is here, right? And you can get into that from like a philosophical standpoint if you want, but like my belief system is like if I'm the one there and there's no one else to do the right thing, then like that is God or that is the universe that is presenting me an opportunity to um, to do something good, right? And to to help somebody. So when I saw what they were doing to me as far as like not respecting my boundaries, like so much to the point where I flew over to the UK and someone that was on my no list showed up on the scene. Wow. Like, like so obvious a transgression. Um, I would show up to a scene and again, this is over in the UK. I have no support system over there and they know that like they're not dummies. Uh, They there's like six people in a room like you're going to do a huge um, like a a huge orgy scene. You're going to sleep with everybody. And I'm like, that's not on my approved list. Like I've never done that. It's not something I want to do. Um, It wasn't a discussion like in it's still a business. So all of these acts are all priced out and they're all negotiated. So what they've done in the past with other performers is they know that most people are agreeable. They're not going to want to rock the boat. They know that if they cause trouble that they can get blacklisted. So they're just going to say, okay, I just, I don't want to cause any trouble. So I'm going to do it. So then they get more out of the performer. They make more on the back. And now that performer, they don't care what happens to her at the end of the day. Now she did a scene that she can't capitalize on that she wasn't okay with. And now that other people are going to expect because it's already out there. So it's a it's a pretty big deal. So once this like happened time and time again, I'm like, I have all of these followers on social. I'm huge within the industry. If they're doing this to me, imagine what they're doing to someone who's just getting in, who has no voice, who has no platform, who has no account. Like, um no credibility within the industry so no one's gonna like believe her if she says xyz so again i felt like a duty to to call out the bad behavior so i ended up getting blacklisted and i actually couldn't shoot with anybody for like six plus months like no one would touch my brand because it's essentially a monopoly there's a few successful smaller independent companies that shoot but it's not many like it's primarily one big company that kind of owns everybody so they were like you're not allowed to to give her work so um with that coupled with some health stuff that came up so i have um like one of my conditions i like pcos so polycystic ovarian syndrome i would get ready to shoot and all of a sudden and this is not an exaggeration i would get a cyst the size of a lemon on my ovary and my doctor was like you cannot shoot you cannot shoot like the scenes are it's not normal sex it's very um you know aggressive and the guys are bigger and if it if it pops on set then you could go to the hospital so like i just don't want you going out to work and i was like okay this happened three times in a row and again someone that kind of believes in a little bit of fate and free will i was like this is a sign this is a very clear sign i am not supposed to be doing this so i kind of like uh officially unofficially announced my retirement out of the industry and started my own production company it's like if i'm going to do this i'm in charge 100 percent of the way um and i don't need anyone else and it was terrifying because there's a huge financial factor i mean i'm blacklisted at this point i'm like what if my name goes away i have no idea like how loyal like my community or fan base is like what is gonna happen you can't do a regular job after you do porn no one's gonna hire you so it was a terrifying place to be. It's like, what am I going to no. do? And I just had to have faith. Mm, yeah. Well, that's that take that requires a lot of faith. Yeah. But again, so, do the right thing. Do the right thing. Yeah. And and um, so you mentioned you had, P- you had PCOS and there was a cyst that would form before a scene. Was that because of the stress of thinking about the scene that caused it? I'm sure stress plays a f- huge factor. Absolutely. I mean, we all know that 
that's a massive predictor of whether or not something's going to turn on or off as far as like autoimmune issues, um, just the, your overall health in general. But I do also think that there's like a little bit of magic that happened. You know what I mean? It was just like a little bit of a nudge it, to help me kind of make the right decision because I was making decisions based off of fear. It's like I can't, I have to keep shooting because of like the scarcity mindset that I had around finances and like not truly believing that I could be successful on my own. Like I needed a company to make me successful. And then I stopped shooting for other companies and my production company was making me way more than I did when I was in the industry. And then other platforms um, popped up like OnlyFans. And then it was like, no, this is like, this is what you're worth. This is what your brand is worth. And you're like, holy cow, I've been undervaluing myself this entire time. And I think that that's probably true no matter what industry you're in. It's like no matter who you're working for, they kind of undervalue you. And it takes you making a really big, bold move to understand like your own worth. Yeah. So interesting. So you did, uh, you also had an OnlyFans account or mm -hmm. do you currently have an OnlyFans yeah. account? Mm -hmm. So what are you, so interesting because I, I don't have one obviously, but I have a, a friend of mine. Um, his name is Paul. <laughs> I don't think he'll mind me saying, saying his name. Very attractive guy, super fit. And I'm always telling him, hey, why don't you create an OnlyFans account and, and make some income? So explain OnlyFans for those who don't know what it is and how it could be actually a, a potentially good way to generate some money. And, um, at the same time, respect your body and respect yourself. So you don't have it. Like there are creators on there that are not explicit at all. Like, there's comedians, there's cooks, there's personal trainers. You can kind of make it whatever you want. Um, if you do want to go into really? the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's oh, everyone always that. thinks it's just porn. Like that's probably yeah, 80% that's of right the thought. accounts, but I would say that there's probably 15, 20% that are operating like above board. Like they're not they're not trying to sell sex on any level. Um, so you can do it for whatever your business is, honestly. But if you are trying to do it for like, even if it's not explicit, but like bikini photos or like sexy, like glamour shots, it's just like a really cool way to build like an audience to build an audience. You are 100% in control of what you show, what you shoot, you own the content. It's not to say people aren't going to pirate it and put it out. So that is something to take note of. So if you're doing it with hopes of anonymity, I would say throw that out the window because in this mm -hmm. day and age, nothing is, stays anonymous forever. So you have to be, um, you have to like really know your why going into it. So I wouldn't say do it purely as a cash grab either because most accounts don't make more than like a thousand dollars a month. So, and that that might be all you want or all you need. And again, make your decision for yourself. I never, even with the agency, we never talk to anyone that doesn't already have an account because I feel like that decision is so personal that they have to have made it themselves. And I don't want to influence that because there is a huge social fallout from that. Unfortunately, like there still is a lot of shame and a lot of, um, guilt around sex and sexuality, especially if you're a woman. So you have to deal with how the world views that decision. It doesn't really matter what you think. There's still real world consequences to that. So, um, you know, I don't want to ever like push anyone to do it if they didn't already find themselves there. Yeah, it's a very um, controversial topic. I mean, I'm sure several people listening to this right now or watching on YouTube as, as they're like offended, you know, from what, what whatever we just spoke about in 21 minutes. But hey, <laughs> get over it. We're all adults, and you gotta admire somebody who has followed her passion and created something really cool from it. I, I want to stay on the topic of porn because um, I've seen porn become a problem for a lot of guys, specifically, especially with like porn addiction. And there's this porn brain, what it does to the brain. Can you share a little bit about your perspective on it in this current day and age? So no professional, like no actual um, like psychologist or neuroscientist and especially neuroscientists because they're the ones that are doing fMRIs on the brain and actually seeing like how things light up when it comes to addiction. Like porn addiction, sex addiction is not a thing. Now you can ask the question, should we maybe redefine what addiction means to be able to encompass these new age I issues that people are having, whether it's porn, food, social media, um, you gambling, you name it, right? Because people do have an addictive nature. But if you were to actually take a scan of the brain and like go through the list of what makes something qualify as an addiction, sex and porn and gambling actually don't cut the bill. So most of the people that are using that terminology have like a very religious and undertone and agenda to it. And that's fine. You know, everyone's allowed to believe what they want to believe, but it's not honest. Now, do people have a problem with porn and sex? Absolutely. 
So I think that's where the dissonance happens. They're like, well, if it's not an addiction, then why are there people that watch it for eight hours a day and they're missing work and they're not connecting with their loved ones or they're not dating. So from the neuroscientists that I've spoken with on my podcast and actual sex researchers that are involved in this space, it's more of like a compulsion issue. It's more of a per- procrastination issue. So if you were to remove the porn, remove the sex or remove um, the food or the gambling, something else would take its place. So there's an underlying issue that's not being addressed. And the porn is the symptom. It's not the actual cause of the issue. So I think we're all facing a, a crisis of connection. I think that's not uniform to to just men. I think it's showing up in men as porn. And that's just the data that's more easily and readily available. So that's kind of what we're focusing on. And again, like that subject is so highly charged and sensationalized. So again, it's getting a lot of attention. But you have to like ask, why are you avoiding connection with people? Maybe it's fear of rejection. Maybe um, it's fear of failure, whatever it is, but you have to get down to that. And if it's a problem within a relationship, again, you have if you're just trying to get rid of the porn because you have jealousy, you're not going to actually fix the issue with your partner. So you have to be able to remove yourself and your really big emotions and say, well, what's the goal? Is the goal to connect with my husband and to reignite our our passion in the bedroom? Let's focus there because then that's where change is going to happen. If you're focusing on like the boogeyman, you're not going to actually get the results that you want out of the relationship. And I get being jealous. I was the most fiercely jealous to an unhealthy level woman there was out there. Like I would have been in the camp porn is cheating in my younger years. Absolutely. But you have to kind of ask yourself why. And if you maybe look at it as not a threat to your relationship and maybe a tool that you can use to come closer together or to like maybe bridge that gap between the, the difference in the sexual appetites that men and women actually have. I don't have to feel so responsible for every single time my husband wants to have sex. Like there's other options, right? He can go entertain himself. And that's a lot less pressure. Or if I'm bored, then in one of us is bored in the bedroom. Like it's a cool way to like spice up the relationship and maybe get ideas ideas of what we can incorporate between the two of us. So maybe don't look at it as a threat and use it as a tool. That's that's a paradigm shift. That's an interesting perspective. Uh, I definitely can get on board with it being a compulsion and more of a, a symptom to something else that's missing in their life. And we got to figure out what the causes are, not just look at that symptom of watching porn all the time. I have to admit that I haven't done a lot of research on porn and what it does to the brain and all that. And I'm kind of just repeating what's been out there. So mm-hmm. I'm glad that you kind of corrected that and said there's not, actually, and I need to check this for myself because I haven't done the research myself, but you're saying you've interviewed scientists, you've done some research, and there's actually no research out there that shows watching porn, even watching it excessively creates uh, any, any kind of negativity with the brain when it comes to like dopamine pathways or, or what's no. going on. nothing's out See, that's like a whole nother clickbait thing, too, is like this dopamine thing. And uh, Dr. Deb Brousseau uh, gets a little bit into it. So does Dr. Nicole Prousey. So if anyone wants to check out their work, they're both sex researchers. So neuroscientists, sex researchers, not just, you know, these charlatans with an opinion. So when it comes to a dopamine hit, just to give you an idea, and this is on one of my podcast episodes with Dr. Nicole Prousey. So we try to say like there's this massive dopamine hit that you get from watching porn, and that's why you get so addictive. There's not much more in that than it is like eating a cheeseburger. So why is it showing up for the guy in porn and not the cheeseburger? And then if you compare, um, if you compare orgasming by yourself, even with pornography, compared to having sex with a real partner, there's a certain um, certain kind of nerve that gets stimulated when someone else touches you versus when you touch yourself. So. I'm sure you, you've you had that. Like if you're rubbing your shoulder because it really hurts, it feels some type of way. But if you have someone else massage you, it feels different and you can't For really sure. understand yeah. why. Something else is getting triggered when someone else's skin touches your skin. So the comparative of orgasming by yourself, even with pornography compared to someone else's skin touching you, it's in, it's incomparable. It's like totally off the charts. Like that would be the fireworks. That would be the thing that would show up as addiction. And even that starts to actually decline the more you do it. You know what I mean? Like you can't have sex like 12 times in a row and it gets better and better. You start to like fade a little bit. So that's actually the opposite of an addiction as well. The addiction is supposed to get stronger, not weaker. So just from that, it's I don't know. Like, I I think it's just like little catchy phrases that we use. And honestly, you scrolling through TikTok is going to be way worse for your brain as far as like a dopamine um, depletion yeah. level than watching a, a porno because you're watching 10 second clips. Right. And then that's just kind of feeding 
that loop. So there's something called TikTok brain, and I guess that's being talked a lot on Reddit, and it's supposed to actually be negatively affecting the gray matter in your brain and your uh, short-term memory. So why don't we look at that? Because that's something that kids are on way more than those tube sites that they also should not be on. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, fair point. And I'm going to, I'm going to listen, I'm going to listen to those podcast interviews that you did. Uh, Candace has a great podcast, by the way, it's called chatting with Candace and you also have a YouTube channel. We'll put the podcast link down below. What about, and again, I'm not an expert, so I'm, I'm just asking you the questions. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. What about those who say when, when a man watches porn, it creates an unrealistic kind of expectation with what sex is and what it looks like. And it could decrease the intimacy with their partners. Any, is there any validity to that? Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna, they actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's going to cause you to sweat. And one method of fleshing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And I, every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60-minute massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, you're going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audiobook. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code on charge hooked you up so head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your bond charge products all right let's get back to today's video so first i'll say into i don't think it's sex and intimacy are are inextricably connected i think you have to really yeah. work on intimacy and i think that that's a mm -hmm. huge issue, which is we automatically assume that they're one in the same. So if you're not putting in the work to be intimate with your partner, your partner, you're like, well, why doesn't this feel how it should? It's because like, you're just showing up. You're just showing up and hoping that there's fireworks. And maybe you've been with the, the, the guy for like two years and you're like, why doesn't this feel like it used to? Well, it's something like after um, like six or nine months, your neurochemistry actually changes with the partner. So all of the, the things that flooded you made you feel like in love and those butterflies they're not there anymore. You can recreate them and there's some really cool ways that you can do that and like recreate that neurochemistry, but that's kind of what it comes down to. So when it comes to um, unrealistic expectations, I would say, do you also have unrealistic expe expectations as to how he's supposed to show up after you watch a Ryan Gosling movie? right? Do you watch The Notebook and you're like, well, why didn't you hang yeah. from a Ferris wheel for me and build yeah. me this house with a painting room, all of these things, or kiss yeah. me in the rain and have this passionate sex? We do the same thing, but we don't want to you know, take responsibility on our end either. So it's yeah. the same. I don't think that you should be guilting your husband or boyfriend because he's not Ryan Gosling. And I don't think that he should be making you feel le like less of a woman or less like a goddess because you're not Jenna Jameson. So I think men should do the work to still keep the romance within the light in within the relationship. And I think women should also show up to still like be that sexy goddess and, you know, keep that that ember burning as well. So it's like showing up for each other in the ways that you need. And again, not looking at the other things as threats is just like it's entertainment. 
right? The It'll become an issue when you're bringing that entertainment in with this expectation of that's supposed to be your reality, whether it's with porn or the rom-coms or the erotica. So it's you, honest communication, asking your partner what you want and being open and receptive to it, but not guilting them for not showing up as, you know, that star. Yeah, fair point. Yeah, and it's funny because sometimes my fiance watches these like Korean soap opera whatever tv shows that i don't watch and she's like how come you don't do that for me and it's like she does it jokingly yeah. and we have a great relationship but it's exactly kind of what you're saying it's like it's, un- it's not realistic it's a tv show mm-hmm. number one um you mentioned there's a difference between sex and intimacy and for sure so what are some ways um for a, for some a couple um to be intimate without actually having sex like what are some of your favorite ways to be intimate with your um with your husband you're married right yes yes yeah. um so favorite, ways? favorite ways i think for me i love having like really deep conversations with him like around topics that maybe like people would say i don't know cause like fights between the two of them like really getting into like jealousy what does he like you know sexual desires that he might have that i might have um role playing like talking about things that you could add to the bedroom if it's not with sex i think uh like long hugs i think we don't even realize how quick we are to like push people away from us and it's like being comfortable with that eye gazing I think is huge and I think it'll really surprise people how uncomfortable you are just looking Mm -hmm. into someone's eyes with no distractions around you even if you've been with someone for like a decade and you're like man we really don't just lock eyes and like see you like see you so eye gazing is huge I think doing really difficult things together that push you outside of your comfort zone is also really important. And it shows you how to kind of connect with each other and maybe where you might have some emotional seams if something's really difficult. So like where you'll kind of snap at the person, you're like, okay, well, maybe we can work on that. Um, Maybe this is like the Achilles heel of our relationship at the moment. So we, uh, we try to do something difficult and like kind of out of the box every year. So this year we're doing fit for service, which is an Aubrey Marcus program. Yeah, and like great. Day one, we were doing like this circling thing. And I, I don't know if you've ever done circling before. No. So you, you kind of like have a group of people and the facilitator will ask a certain question. There's a ton of eye gazing with a stranger and holy cow, is that awkward? And mm-hmm. she'll ask you a question and you just have to be as present as possible. So it's like I'm perceiving, um, I feel, I want, oh, it's basically, it's not, um, it's not like putting your own agenda onto it. So you know how often like when we talk to somebody, you're like, oh, I have the perfect response to that. It's getting rid of that voice. It's like extreme presence and trusting that you are going to actually hear exactly what the person is saying without your own overlay over it. And then being able to ask a really deep question and kind of continue that conversation back and forth. It's really interesting. I don't know if I'm describing it exactly right. You'd have to kind of look it up. And it's one of those things you have to experience. You know what I mean? Like it just translate. I, I understand what you're saying. And it's funny because uh, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine came to my place and we recorded content on my rooftop. And it reminds me of what you shared because uh, we had a videographer and he was interviewing me for his YouTube channel and they only had one mic. So those little lapel mics. So we had to, he would ask, he would talk, ask the question, and then we would pause and then he would give me the mic, but it forced me and it forced him to only listen and not interject the entire time. So it was funny and it was weird and different. But after the conversation, I was like, man, imagine if we always pretended there's only one mic and you can't talk until that person is, that mic is passed over. It's kind of like what you just said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very close. Fascinating. Okay. I remember when I was younger and I used to watch porn, one of the things that I did not like about it, and I think now that I'm kind of hearing what you're saying today, I, I every time I watched it, and I was done. I felt guilty. I felt, and I, and it gave me like low. My self esteem was lowered. I felt guilty, and I think it was around the shame and the guilt around watching it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So they've done studies when it comes to 
like that um, post porn brain. So like right after a man ejaculates after watching porn, what they've found based off of the research is that the men that felt that overwhelming or just like inherent guilt and shame and yuck afterwards tended to be raised by more conservative parents or like religious parents that didn't show up with people that were more um, that were raised in more liberal households or um, like more spiritual or like less denominational households. So what they saw kind of across the board was the parenting and belief system that they were raised in. So it's not, it wasn't universal and there was definitely like a cultural aspect to it. So then you can ask yourself, right? Like if you're noticing this, is this serving me? Like, does this help my life? Is this something that I believe in? Is this something I want to keep going? Um, like, what do I want my relationship to sexuality to be? Like, right, you can reframe that however you'd like. And if it does suit you and your lifestyle and you are religious and you're like, okay, this is against my principles, absolutely. But just, again, like, consciously make those decisions for yourself. Well said. Okay, let's transition. Now that we've lost a certain percentage of people who got offended, it is what it is. <laughs> Those who are still here, thank you for not being offended and actually, you know, being open-minded. Um you talk a lot about health too. I mean, you have a blog and you talk about living a healthy lifestyle and active, active lifestyle. So what are your favorite ways? Because as an entrepreneur, I, I um, do you know who Patrick Bet David is? Yeah. Value payment? Yeah. So he is my mentor. Tomorrow I'm actually going to his office and doing a workshop for a sales team in Fort Lauderdale. But he once told me the bigger the vision, the more energy required. And that is so true. As an entrepreneur, somebody wants to scale a business, you want to do that, I want to do that. It requires more energy. And in order to have that energy, you got to be healthy. You have to have vitality. You got to make sure you're doing the right things for your health because your health, it really is your wealth. So I say all that to ask you, like, what are the things you do for your health to make sure you're focused, you're energized, you're vital, and you're able to scale your business and actually be present for your family and your friends? Constantly checking in, right? Health is constantly evolving, changing stressors in our life. If you've um, given birth, like these really big life events can trigger certain um, imbalances or autoimmune issues, or maybe you get caught up in like the workflow and you don't realize that you're in the middle of a burnout and you're not being as productive as you actually think that you're being. So being able to kind of constantly check in and make sure that you're balanced or at least trying to get balance, which I think is the closest that most of us will get is that we're almost mm -hmm. there and then we dip and then we're almost there. Um, for me, it's also radical honesty with myself because I think sometimes we're like, no, I'm I'm not tired. I'm not burnt out. I can do another podcast. I can schedule another meeting. Um, I've spent enough time with the kids today, right? And you know whether or not that's off kilter or not. That's like just something internally, especially as I think moms that we're like in touch with is, you know, am I showing up for my family as much as I'm showing up for myself and my business? So for me, um, I get my blood work done at least once a month. So because I, so I, oh, wow. yeah, I have Graves disease. So it's a hyperthyroid yeah. autoimmune disorder. Um, yeah. And right now it's flipped and we're in Hashimoto's. So that's a beautiful <laughs> thing. So we're trying to sort that. So I'm getting my blood work done like every other week um, or once a month and just checking everything, like all of my vitamins, my hormones, my thyroid, seeing what's going on there and then adjusting accordingly to that. I do um, a gut microbiome test once a year to also see uh, what's happening with my gut because that is a huge indicator of your health. So whether or not certain things are causing inflammation, what to remove, what to add. Um, we have a cold plunge that I can't use right now because I'm still breastfeeding and that can dry you up. So I'm waiting till that breastfeeding journey is done because I'm a huge advocate for cold therapy. We have an infrared sauna that I try to go in a couple times a week. Um, nice. Yeah. So, I mean, we we do a lot. I, we have a garden. So I try to eat very clean, very healthy. I definitely indulge. Like, So don't get me wrong. I'm not like gluten-free or dairy-free or anything like that. But it's just being very conscious of the balance of what I'm eating. Like, did I have pasta twice, three times this week? Okay, well, I need to adjust for the rest of the week. Um, working out, this is what I think is really interesting. So a lot of the workout regimens that we see online are very, uh, very intense, very cortisol um, driven and like kind of geared for men. But what we don't realize is a lot of like these hit training movements cause a huge cortisol spike in women. And we're a lot more susceptible to that because we are meant to carry children. So our bodies react a lot differently. I'm a big advocate in gentle movement for women. So whether it's Pilates, bar, yoga, 
it's not to say don't do weights, but it's just to do weights maybe a little bit differently than a man would do do them. When I started uh, making my workout routines a lot more gentle, I noticed a huge change in how I appeared on the outside. Like I slimmed up faster than I'd ever done in my life. And I wasn't even doing anything with my diet. It was just getting rid of stress. And a lot of us don't realize that our workouts can be causing undue stress on our body. So, you know, women, we're meant to kind of cling on to fat because it's like, okay, she can get pregnant at any moment. And obviously that's different if you're postmenopausal, but she can get pregnant at, at any moment. So she has to have a healthy fat reserve to sustain yeah. second life. So you kind of have to think of like working um, with your biology instead of against it. Yeah, all that well said. Exactly. You know, men and women definitely got to do things differently. Even with keto, my book, um, Keto Flex, I have an entire chapter on women doing keto and fasting very different than men doing it, to your point. Something that's also really interesting because you're right, women need to have more body fat. It's going to be important for reproduction. The number one priority for the body is survival. And of course, that's part of survival, reproducing. But um, I interviewed. Dr. Sylvia Terra, a few years ago, she wrote a great book called The Secret Life of Fat, all about how fat works in the body and how you accumulate fat, et cetera. And in her research, she showed that women experience after exercise 33% more ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, which is telling their body to eat more food after exercise. Do you notice when you exercise, oh, yeah, you get more it's hungry? horrible. Yeah. I'm insatiable after I work out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's, you know, survival. The body wants you to put on the calories. And you see that with women who are really aggressive with exercise and they get their body fat into single digits. What happens? They lose their period. That's not healthy, mm -mm. right? So women are designed to have more body fat. And yeah, some women might have a little bit less body fat because of genetic components, but in general, got to do it the right way and go with your physiology, like you just said. So I love that. And yeah, cold plunging, you're, you're gonna, that's going to be great when you get back into that after breastfeeding. Yeah. All those are, are wonderful tools. Anything else that you do in terms of biohacks um, that have made a big difference or did you cover them all right there? So uh, meditation, I think, is probably a huge one that I left off. So I think that that's incredible for everyone. And I forget who said it. Um, it might have been it might have been Gandhi. It's one of those mystics. But if you don't have 15 minutes a day to meditate, then you need to do it for an hour. So <laughs> yeah. it creates more time. It creates more energy. And if you do specific mindfulness meditations, it's it's five times more effective than sleep which is crazy. Like you are better off doing a, a very specific type of meditation versus taking the nap. And then you're not going to have that. I, I don't know about you, but I get like hangover naps. Like I wake up and I'm like, where am I? What time is it? Is it the next day? Yeah. Is it light out? It just, it, it messes me up more than it helps. So I just started um, this protocol. It's by Ziva and she's amazing. It's uh, founded by Emily Fletcher and they have this really cool online course. So I started that last week and it's so far one of my favorite meditation practices I've done so far. So that's huge. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, I interviewed um, a, a lady, a teacher, her name is Amanda Gilbert. The interview actually comes out tomorrow um, from this conversation. And she, on the, on the interview, she was sharing what meditation does to actually increase your telomeres. And that is anti-aging, right? The longer your telomeres, the more it protects your DNA. I didn't realize that. I, I knew meditation had its benefits, but I didn't realize there was actual research that shows it helps with anti-aging. It's super cool. It will it can reverse your um, like your biological age. Your, cellu your cellular age. Yeah, 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 cellular age. Cellular That's age. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how long do you do it for your meditation? So these ones are about 20 minutes. Um, and I have a feeling as the course goes on, it's going to probably get longer. I think waking up is also an incredible app for people that are trying to yeah. get into meditating. Um, and then I also am a big fan of breath work. So being able to alter your state through breath. So I use Othership, which is... Yeah, an inc right. Oh, do you use that? I had him. Uh, yeah, he's a friend of mine, Robert. He was oh. on my... Um, podcast. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. He's amazing. And I love, I love that app. Uh, what I think of that's great about that is I'm like a very kinesthetic person. So I feel like I have to move all of the time. So meditation can be really tricky for me, but with his breath work, there's this awesome music. You can set the lights. Um, it's very, in, like it's instructed. So you're not left hanging. Like, you know, exactly what you're supposed to do. Some of them you actually move with and stretch with and dance with. And I'm like, this is my jam. I can, <laughs> yeah. I can move and feel like I'm in charge, but also, get the benefits of like if I need to calm calm my state or kind of raise my energy whatever it is and they have really cool couple exercises um cold plunge exercises yeah yeah they're big on cold plunge he's gonna he, he told me they're gonna they have facilities in I think Toronto 
they're going to bring some down to Miami and I think Austin as well. So they're like expanding with cold plunges and biohacking stuff. It's called other ship for those who are wondering if you want to download it, it's a great app. And you're right. A lot of people think meditation is like, you got to be a Buddhist monk and it, that's not it. Mm -mm. There's different ways to do meditation. So for me, um, I do a Tony Robbins routine in the morning, uh, his priming routine. It's a 15 minute routine where it's like breath work, arm movement. This one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> gratitude, um, and then there's also, you know, grabbing like moments in your life, bringing it to your heart. And I start my day like that. And it's just incredible to start your day like that. Uh, have you ever done just curious, have you ever done a Tony Robbins course, like unleash the power within or anything like that? No, my husband's done a couple. He's done some of the in-person events. Uh, and then he is the one that is bringing this stuff to me. So we used to do that when we first had our, um, first son, we would spend the morning. That's how we did it. It would be like the, yes. <laughs> And it makes a huge difference. It's like start your day off with intention. Exactly. Yeah. So he, I would recommend, I think you would really love one of his um, in-person uh, events, the Unleash the Power Within. Me and my fiance did it a few months ago and it was just a game changer. And speaking of which, you mentioned like looking at people's eyes and how that's uncomfortable. He had us do that at the event with my fiance and it was uncomfortable. It's like so weird. Like that's somebody I love. We love each other. Yeah. And we have to stare at each other for a couple minutes and it felt weird and it shouldn't. No. So I shouldn't. highly recommend his Unleash the Power Within. It is absolutely fantastic. It's incredible. Oh yeah. I'll check it out. If the next one's going to be in Dallas, by the way, in I think November, I think we'll, we're going to go to it. Oh, cool. So um, hormone replacement therapy. You said that uh, offline, that's something that could be a valuable um, tool for, for women out there. So share a little bit more about your thoughts on HRT. So throughout my health journey and having taken my blood work all of the time and constantly trying to figure out what I can tweak and what needs improvement, you don't realize that no, like we hear about men and hormone replacement therapy all of the time and low T in men and how they can fix it and all the co health consequences of them having low T. But we don't really talk about it for women. And we have a ton of testosterone, right? Like obviously not as much as men, but we don't talk about it. And we are kind of just automatically, um, we just like, we talk about estrogen and that's it. But what happens mm -hmm. when you have low T is kind of the same that happens with men, right? You have low sex drive, low energy, you can start gaining weight. Um, you have like low, like less of a vigor for life. And we don't realize that it's something as simple as a hormone imbalance. Well, we are living in, you know, in the future, essentially, where you can kind of biohack these things. If you can find a professional, um, like a legitimate professional that's a doctor, not just like someone that's like sending out these hormones like they do nowadays with telehealth, don't do that. Um, find yeah. someone reputable, but you can play around with your hormones and it could be as simple as just putting on a cream. So before um, I was pregnant with my second and breastfeeding, it was a cream I put on the inside of my elbow or behind my knee just once a day. And then that helped balance out my, my load. My tea was so incredibly low. And then I was like, this explains why nothing else is working. I'm so exhausted. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of ways to naturally boost that. So you do need to kind of like get a little help from a doctor if you have really low T. It could be stress, right? So you could try with stress uh, mitigation. Something like meditation would be huge and just like getting in, in control of your schedule. So I like think start there, but talk to your doctor and see what that what they recommend. And unfortunately, there's no clinical studies right now when it comes to women in T. So you have to kind of find someone who's pioneering that and be comfortable with it. I mean, I'm my own guinea pig and I, tr I'm comfortable with my professional and I trust him. So, um, yeah, I think it's something that women should really look into and just like see where your hormones are at. We talk about, um, you know, how, how men get to age and get more distinguished and women age and we're like, why does my skin look like shit? Well, it's because you have low T, right? You yeah. have low T. These men that are aging are, are doing HRT and that's why they're looking more distinguished and they're aging very gracefully as they have a little bit of help. So just because you're a woman doesn't mean that you shouldn't be taking um, your hormone hormonal health into your own hands because you absolutely can't. So just find a doctor that you that supports you um, and that you trust and kind of like take a look at where you are. Yeah, there's a time and place for it for sure. And I, I, I love the idea of testing. I, I, I'm impressed that you test every month. It's so important to see what your numbers are looking like. If you're not testing, you're just guessing, right? So mm -hmm get some hormone panel, get a hormone panel done. There's also a great test called the Dutch test. Have you ever done that mm -mm. or heard of it? I've heard yeah. of it. I've Dutch, it. Yeah. It's a fantastic hormone test. It's a, it's, it's a urine test. So it's not blood. You can do it at home, but it gives you a great idea 
of uh, your estrogen and also where your estrogen is going. Is it going down the right pathway, the more toxic pathway? There's three different pathways that they, the focus is on the 2, 4, and 16, but it gives you an idea of that, your adrenal health, testosterone. And there is a myth out there, you're right, that women don't have testosterone or don't need testosterone. But women, although they don't have as much testosterone as men, that's true, but women have 30 times more testosterone than they do estrogen. Um, so it's a very important hormone for men and for women. And when you're low in it, it's hard to function. It's hard to put on muscle. It's hard to just feel great. So yes, there is a time and place for it, but you do want to work with somebody who's looking at those numbers and making sure it's not going too high because there could be problems with that as well. So I love mm -hmm. that you do that and it's good work. Thanks. Yeah. Um, another cool little hack too, especially for women that are maybe feeling like they don't have a lot of energy or they're really burnt out or they're really stuck when it comes to like fat loss is doing one of those saliva uh, cortisol tests. So kind of mm -hmm. you like spit into this vial throughout the day and you send that off and they kind of tell you where your um, cortisol levels are at. So what I've heard, and you can probably fact check me on this, is that because we obviously don't have testicles, that most of our adrenaline adrenals are producing the hormones in our body so that we're more likely to get adre like quote adrenal fatigue and have more adverse responses to cortisol than men because of that. So our a pituitary gland and um will kind of like run low before man's cuz like you have like the tes the testicles to to help with the hormones. Yeah, well that happens more so when the woman is entering perimenopause. Yeah, for sure mm -hmm. because what happens is the ovaries um, they retire, they, they shut down when a woman goes through menopause and then the adrenals have to pick up the slack. So then yeah, they're more susceptible to with, um, adrenal fatigue because now the adrenal glands are picking up the slack for the ovaries, no longer functioning, and then it overwhelms it. So doing that test, um, the Dutch test does the same thing. Okay. It does the 24 hour pattern, but also to your point, there's also saliva tests too, that do that. And it gives you that pattern, right? That 24 hour pattern. You want to make sure your cortisol is highest, but in range in the morning. And then it kind of tapers down. Some people have the complete opposite. I know I did several years ago. So it gives you an idea of where you're at and then you can make some changes. So yeah, testing is the name of the game. Mm -hmm. I agree. Question for you, before we hit record, uh, before you hopped on the squad cast here, what was on your mind? Like what, not in regards to our conversation, just in life in general, like what was on your mind before we hopped on the call today? Oh, I was doing some emails. Um, I had an issue and I guess it goes back to industry stuff and like the importance of sovereignty and owning your own stuff and uh, being your own advocate in whatever industry you're in. So I've been with this company since they were created. It was something as simple as they were holding my domain name. I owned it, but they were like housing it for me. It needed to get renewed. And like typically they would just take it off of my balance because like they they do my uh, credit card processing as well. So it was something that they would just take out, like debit out. Um, they didn't pay for a $15 bill and an account, like a domain I've had for almost a decade, went to auction and mm. was auctioning for like $5,000 for a domain wow. name that I rightfully owned that they just didn't renew for $15 because they're pissed at me. So I was like, oh man, this just showed me, um, this showed me how free I'm not. And it was a great blessing because I'm a huge advocate for, you know, owning your own stuff and, um, being your own custodian. And I was like, this is one area that I forgot that I'm not living up to what I, what I preach. So now the project is, is find a web developer, find hosting, do it all myself and figure out what that's going to look like to move it all over because I can't, I can't exist in a space where someone owns something of mine or is responsible for something of mine. Um, it's just, it's not in, in my belief system within that industry. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. What a blessing. I love the perspective that you had on that. It's a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. So where is the best website for you? Maybe it's not that one, but where is the best website for my audience to go check you out? Oh, you can go to chattingwithcandice.com and that has all my podcasts, my YouTube, my Candace socials. Hopefully for all of you that are still listening, thank you and uh, check out the podcast. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. You know, I, this was an awesome conversation. I, I really hope most people who tuned in at the beginning are still here because you gave so many nuggets and I, you know, it's just natural for us to talk about something controversial for people to sign off, but it was a great conversation. And I have one more question for you. I talk a lot about a 
vitamin. Uh, I think it's the most important health vitamin you could take. Once you take it, it puts you in an anti-inflammatory state. And Dr. Joe Dispenza, he did brain scans on individuals going through his course, and they gave him this vitamin. He gave them this vitamin, which is vitamin G, by the way. And then he looked at their brain and looked at their body through MRI, and he saw 1,200 chemical reactions take place like instantaneously when they took vitamin G. So he saw a boost in serotonin and GABA and dopamine, oxytocin, all these neurochemicals that help them feel good, put them in this anti-inflammatory state. So the vitamin is vitamin G, and it stands for vitamin gratitude. It's the <laughs> practice of gratitude. And I'm a big believer in gratitude. I wear T-shirts that say vitamin G. So I say all of that to ask you the question, um, what are you grateful for right now? Grateful. I'm grateful to have met you and um, have a new friend. I'm grateful for the opportunity to create my own reality. Like I have a sense of freedom within my life and my family has a sense of freedom that I mean, I couldn't have dreamed of. So to be able to walk upstairs and hit record and meet someone awesome like yourself and talk to your cool listeners and like, this is my life. This is my job. And I get I'm in charge and I don't have to show up to a cubicle for nine to five to have someone yell at me because I I didn't send an email on time or whatever it is. Like, I'm just so grateful for that amount of freedom. Ah, oh, that's something really to be grateful for, to be able to live on purpose with your purpose. That is awesome. Well, Candice, thank you for uh, coming on my podcast and sharing so authentically and just being who you are. Uh, radical confidence. That's exactly what you exhibit. So we're going to put your website and podcast and YouTube down below. Everybody go check out what the, the great work Candice is doing. And I look forward to maybe hanging out in Miami or Austin or some somewhere in the future. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Today. Of course. Yeah, I look forward to it.